you all got quiet. <laughs> yes, once again, you get the double feature, me at Sunday school and then me again in the second hour. And uh, unless one of you wants to volunteer to preach today, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Okay. All right. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering this morning, and as we uh, approach the uh, scripture, we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, be within us and around us, and as we hear words spoken, that all of our reflections uh, might be directed by your presence, and, uh, and what we are able to take away from today will be something that we can use for your honor and your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, sorry, I had yours in, on the front of mine. <laughs> Next week's. A conquering faith is today's. A conquering faith. And it comes from 1 John, the fourth chapter. So if you want to look that up, fourth chapter, uh, and it's, it's going to move right on into uh, chapters four, to five, four and five. Um, there was um, a song, um, or is a song, Troublesome Times Are Near, Filling Men's Hearts With Fear, and it ends with Jesus is coming soon, ready, or night, or noon, trouble will something or another, ready to meet the doom, Christians awake, and I guess that was the part that got me, was Christians awake, Christians awake, because John is writing these letters. John has written a wonderful gospel, so different than the other two gospel, uh, the other three gospels, because John is this visionary. John uh, knows what the facts are because he was with the other disciples. He walked and talked with Jesus. He's, you know, he's got the facts. But for John, it was John was a thinker. John wanted to know what, in the grand scheme of things, what does this all have to do with anything? You know, and so he focused in on what Jesus said as the commandment, love, love each other as you have been loved, you know, love each other. And so we call the gospel of John, the gospel of love. Now, at the end of the scriptures, we have three letters of John, and then we have this wonderful revelation that John gives the church. And I always look at that like, uh, this is, this is like I told you really what was going on, and then these others have gone out and given witness, but let me tell you where you're at now, <laughs> and it's not looking good, and John is the last of the apostles. He's the last. He's outlived all of them, and uh, I don't know about you, but uh, maybe it, uh, as you look back over your years, as I look over my years, I'm thinking... What happened to the good old days? What happened to those nice days those where, where we didn't have the worries? Now, they probably never were, <laughs> but they do seem so much nicer as I look back on some of the things. I know that there were troubles. I know that when we think of this uh, Afghanistan, when we're leaving Afghanistan, I remember the exodus from Vietnam. Same kind of new, news coverage, no different. And if we get into those positions, it will happen again. History repeats itself. We tend to forget what we live through. And we also, fortunately, sometimes it looks better to us at times. For instance, uh, when, when uh, we'll get to talking about growing up in, in my household, we, we talk about uh, when dad was in Vietnam and the, and the meals that mom would fix for us that, that dad didn't particularly care for because when they were in college, they ate like poor people because they were poor people. <laughs> and he refused to ever eat spaghetti again uh, because that was their fail safe or just simply noodles with butter, which we used to call filler <laughs> because that was what we would have at the end of the month along with refrigerator soup, fancy name for whatever's left in the refrigerator at the end of the month goes into big pot with tomato paste and it is delicious have some more <laughs> a new month is coming dad gets paid next week you know <laughs> good old days 
You know, I, I actually bought potted meat for the first time in years the other day because I hadn't had a potted meat sandwich since I was a, I don't know, since I was in college because I could make five or six sandwiches out of that one little can. You know, good old days when Wendy's, Wendy's when I was in college, they would have a special so I could get a hamburger, a drink, and a frosty for $2. <laughs> I lived for those moments. And so today they're happy, but back then I was counting my pennies. Again, in those days, you could go to the gas station and I had robbed my piggy bank for enough change to get a tank full of gas that was $4. But $4 back then was, that's a lot of money. <laughs> happy days, not so happy. So John is writing these letters because he is a bit fearful. When he's looking back, he's had some wonderful times, and he knows there are some really good people out there who are holding on to the faith, but he also knows it's changing. And it's changing in a way that will, it won't be able to come back from. And I think this is why, essentially, uh, although they say that the, the arrangement of, of the New Testament uh, is in the order of length of letters, Okay, but I think John comes at a good time if you're reading through the scripture. You've had the Acts of the Apostles. You've had Paul and his journeys. You've had his witness to Timothy. And now we come back to one of the apostles, one of those original, who says, uh, I need to write you a letter because something is, looks like it's, it's missing or, or, or maybe you're missing it. And so let me just remind you what it's about. And it was that faith seemed to be moving away. It was a different kind of faith. It was becoming institution, you know? And we have a habit of doing that. When uh, the people I've talked to in the past, well, pastor, I, I, I believe in God. I believe that Christ has saved me. I just don't believe in the church. <laughs> I said, well, I don't either, but it is a nice place to come and hear about those other things. <laughs> he just is afraid of the institution. One of the members in my last parish was 87 years old, had gone to that church for over 60 years. And they asked why he was never a trustee or never a deacon, never on any board. He says, because I never joined the church. <laughs> He married into the church, and, and at the time he married into the church, there was so much going on. He says, I just didn't want to get part of that politics. I've really enjoyed meeting the people and being with the people, and all these years has been good. He says, but Sam, don't make me serve on a committee. <laughs> and I understand that because it is a challenge to faith. When I've talked to people in, in, uh, as a committee on ministry, representative in other conferences and new ministers come because there there are problems at their church a lot of it is that <coughs> the they're challenging their home church institution with their new faith that they came out of seminary with they're they're ready for the lord and we're going to save the world and the folks out there in the pews are going whoa 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 don't move so fast <laughs> hang on hang on we don't do it that way <laughs> and and so that becomes an, an issue. John doesn't want that split to come. And John is the apostle who, who writes then um, about the spirit of God, about the spirit of God. In 1 John, the fourth chapter, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now, I got to tell you, this is the first time these people have ever heard that word Antichrist. It appears nowhere else in Scripture. Nowhere else. Now, there are other, other warnings that Jesus talks about the darkness and the shadows, and he's taking evil spirits out of people, but the Antichrist is a, is a new concept that, that begins really with John. Because 
Antichrist is sort of like that serpent in the Garden of Eden. We don't know exactly what that serpent looked like, but it was there. We don't know what the, the uh, evil spirits looked like when Jesus commanded them to come out, but they were there. John is saying there's a lot that we can't see, but it's here. And we need to be able to discern which is the good spirit and which is not so good, or even the anti, the totally different, the opposite of what the good spirit is. Now, you can look at history of the church over its 2,000 years and possibly see those moments where, oops, <laughs> I think you went over to the dark side for a bit. <laughs> and then the church rallies and it moves back again. I just finished reading uh, a book um, <laughs> that a person gave me because she wants to have a conversation on it. It's not a book that I really care to read. I knew it was out there, but I, I, it just, fortunately, it was a quick read. But uh, it is, uh, uh, it's called The Death of the SS. Uh, Bill O'Reilly wrote it. And the reason she wanted me to read it is because it keeps referencing Pope Pius XII and how he gave in to the Nazis. That was my senior thesis, which I got a D on, because the professor said, there's no way that this is true. And I said, well, I went to William and Mary, did all the research there. These are the original documents that, that of letters and cables that he sent Hitler, and, and it certainly looks like he sold out the church. No, no, it can't be. Now, before this professor died a few years ago, he wrote a book <laughs> on how the Catholic Church sold out. <laughs> and I just wanted to. <laughs> but that's okay. And this friend of mine who wanted me to read it says, I sort of thought so, but why would they do that? I said, well, because you've got, always got the spirit of the church and you got the institution of the church. Now, what happens when you have this great evil in the world who, who by the time you realize how evil he is, has enough military might to come in and set up his office at St. Peter's? <laughs> what are you going to do? I think that Jesus would have said, notice it early, discern evil when he starts putting your priest in concentration camps. You ought to get alarmed. And back then, if the Pope spoke, most of Europe was Catholic. If the Pope said, this is how it's going to be, that's how it was. There was not a, a king, a ruler, any, anyone in that time, not even good Lutherans, who would have stood up and said, oh, no, we don't go with that. They would have gone with it. I think if, if he had said something, even in the United States, the people would have go. Well, uh, we knew the Jews were hurting, but you mean he's putting in Protestant and Catholic priests in, in, in concentration camps too? Oh, we would have been stirred. Think of the Catholics in Boston, you know? Forget about the Tea Party. They would have been, you know, we're going home. We're going to go, you know, because that's, that's what's in us. The spirit would have taken over. But we didn't discern in those days as well. Now, we did discern once things got moving. People came back to church, and we prayed. Churches were full back then, up until the 1960s, when it became another institution, and we seem to have lost the spirit again. So that's why this letter of, from 1 John is still very good for us today. How can you recognize the spirit? You recognize, is Jesus in it or is Jesus not in it? And, and we can often say that, you know, well, was Jesus in it? Well, you know, and, and, and in my mind, in my own life choices, <laughs> I, I think of the, of the story of the, of the brother and sister at their breakfast table. And mom says, all right, got the first waffle done. Uh, who wants it? And um, 
And the uh, little boy uh, says, uh, uh, I'll, give it, I'll give it to my sister. And, and she says, no, I'll, 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 I'll give it to you. That's what Jesus would do. And he says, praise God. Because <laughs> that's what he wanted in the first place. You know? Sometimes it works for us. Sometimes it, it gets us where we're feeling problematic. And we don't really want the answer of, is it a spirit of Jesus or is it not? Continuing in the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us, that God is love. Whoever lives and loves lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him and there is no fear in love. Now, when I read John, in fact, there's a whole passage in the Gospel of John. In my Bible, it goes along for four pages. It pretty much, at the end of it, you go, he could have said that in two sentences. But he was very verbose, and, and that was just his style. And he continues that in his letters. My grandmother would have loved his letter because my grandmother, when I stayed for her for the summer, she would say, have you written your parents yet? No, we'll sit down and write them a letter today, and I'd write a few lines and she says no that's not worth the five cent stamp give me five cents worth now today you would know that wouldn't be anything but back then she was not going to put a stamp on something that was three lines long <laughs> you better think about this boy and so i'd sit and think about it now the relationship that john is talking about here essentially is a two-way relationship if we want to discern what is good and what is evil we need to be in relationship and it's not a one-way street. It's not one that, that uh, says, well, God will tell me. God will speak to me, and it will all be made clear, because we know that's just not how it works. That God really expects us to be engaged in the world, engaged in the word, engaged in the spirit, uh, so that we can have this ability to discern between good and evil. The other thing is that John says, and the reason for this is, we should not underestimate the power that God has given to us in Christ. You know, if you're free from sin, you've got salvation, heaven's coming, eternity is there for you, why are you in a fearful life? Why, why would you even have to fear? What, what is there to fear? What can you not accomplish? That would make you fear. Now, there's a lot of fear in the world today. And I would suggest that as people have come to me and we talk about it, I wait for those words that usually come goes, so it's really not that bad, is it? <laughs> I says, it's how you weigh it out. There have been other generations, other people, other times. There's, in every generation, there is something that weighs heavy on us. And if we react in fear, it doesn't turn out well. If we attach love to it, we have a better chance. That's the power that God has given us. The psalmist writes, uh, and it's my favorite psalm, Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Good, good prayer. We use that every Wednesday because it is my favorite, and because I think it says in a very simple way where we are. It's a confession that we're not alone we need you, God, and this is how I want you to work in me. Give me a willing spirit. Just, you know, 
any, any time uh, you, you've probably had friends who, who have been ill or, or they have uh, been trying to come back from a, a surgery. And one of the hardest things is to get them moving again. And you and I know from people just in this room <laughs> who the movers were who got up quickly and who didn't. You know? Because there has to be something that gets us up in the morning, something that moves us, something that says today is going to be worth coming. And for me, it's, it's because I was created for something. <laughs> Has God completed his work in me? I don't think so. I'm certainly not perfect, and I know there are things that are still on my whiteboard left to do in my lifetime. I just need at times to sit and reflect. I need that willing spirit. I need the, to, to discern, where am I going? And you can't do that if you're always so busy. So in this lesson, there are three sections. One is about the condition. One is about encouragement. And the last one is really about faith that the condition of the world is something we are left with. We, there's really not much you and I can do about what's happening in the world. They have not called on any of us that I can tell lately to go to Washington and be the spokesperson that will settle all the issues, though I know many in this room probably could do that. They just have not asked us yet. The conditions, though, of the spiritual world does affect us. Now, I want you to think of um, when maybe you went to an event and you didn't know a soul there, but you got that invitation and you went and you entered the room. When we do that, do we not think, all right, what's the lay of the land? Or maybe you don't. I always look at, okay, who can I go and and sort of, move to and start a conversation because I've been here all the three minutes and it feels like an eternity, you know? So, so you start looking around and you start working the room. Now, many of you have said, member of the members, when I first came here and we were all gathered back there and I, uh, the, the search committee sort of just let me go and meet and greet all of you because I'm a people person. I, I do that. I, I, my dad taught me, my mom taught me because in our, in, our, in our upbringing, Dad was an a, a instructor at the transportation school at uh, Fort Eustis. And so once a, once a quarter, we'd have his students come to the house, and, and we had to engage in conversation, make sure everybody knew each other. And so my older sister and I are working that room, and we keep working the room. If you've met my older sister, you know she works the room. And if you've met my youngest sister, she could talk to a wall for a half an hour. <laughs> It's just some people have that. But you can walk into a room sometimes and feel, is there a, is there a friendliness that here? Is there a, a sense of, I can, it's going to be an easy event. I have been at, well, my, one of my cousins got married. She requested the theme from The Godfather. That should have told us a lot about the whole <laughs> event. The, the marriage lasted, I think, all of two weeks. Uh, the groom's family and our family at the rehearsal dinner, they sat on one side of the room. We sat on another. There was no conversation between the two. The wedding, you walk into that church and you just, there was not this, oh, this is going to be great. It was really a deadly feeling. And the only thing I could think of, I was glad that she'd asked me to play the organ and not do the service because <laughs> I just would have been really uncomfortable to do that because I just didn't feel it was it was going anywhere and sometimes maybe you can you know that too even in your own life you you know when you get up in the morning I mean my doctor would say you know as from my heart attack he says so why didn't you share the you know why didn't you tell me all these things I said well because you asked me how I was I've never been 62 before I, I, I you know I thought I was doing well for 62 I was, you know I'm looking at people in there 80s who were, you know, ready to play tennis and golf, and I'm just breathing hard. 
but maybe it's a 60s phase and you move into that ease when you get older. <laughs> yeah, you give me that look like, no, it's not gonna happen that way, all right. <laughs> but the conditions, we can't do much about the world, but we can deal with the conditions of our own spiritual life. And so John says, open up yourself and be ready to discern, is it of Jesus? Is it what you knew he taught? Is it, is it consistent with the good news? Or is it some other word? Then that should tell you right there. And the encouragement, it's not a magical power. It's not something you have to beg for. It's something that's given. Again, I'll refer to John Wesley because I spent a lot of years as a Methodist too, so I've got this knowledge in my head. I've got to do something with it. John Wesley said, strive for perfection. Strive for perfection. He says, because from the moment you were born, the Spirit of God was in you, waiting to, to get out. And that when you finally were confirmed or you finally felt that spirit, that's when you make that public announcement. Are you perfect yet? No, but you're on the way to perfection. And so on his deathbed, his friend says, Reverend Wesley, are you perfect? He said, no, but my life would have been so much different had I not aimed high. Had I not believed that God could make me better than what I am. So that's the power that John says is, is why the spirit is so important. It's a power that we don't need to beg for. It's just there, ready to be used. And finally, the faith that uh, John affirms is that victorious faith. I think in the Gospel of John, he already, had already told them there, there was a passage there where uh, Jesus had, had preached a sermon, and it says, and many disciples departed. I've had that happen after a sermon at least a couple of times where I think, well, they're not coming back. <laughs> that really wasn't, you know. I'm not really sure why, but I just got that feeling like mm, they're off to someplace else next week. And, and Jesus asked then his disciples, and will you also go? And what does Peter say? No, where, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You've got the power. Why would we go anywhere else? And so that's really the, the faith part of, of conquering the world. There is no place else to go. He has the power, and the power is within us because the power is that shared spirit. You know, that little thing of where two or three are gathered, there is also the presence of the Lord. And I have served some mighty small gatherings at times and they were powerful gatherings, you know. Doesn't matter the size of the congregation, but it does matter, is the spirit with us? So let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, thank you again for the spirit that is in the word that you give to us, the spirit that was in the disciple John and his concern for the church. We give you thanks. Help us now to take his words and be reminded of your presence as you were with him and gave him strength to his end. Continue to give us strength in the world and the times in which we are challenged by. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.